Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as you will see, um, I have a word file up here because I may be typing some words as I'm speaking that are relevant to the concepts and themes that I'm raising in the talk and may make it easier to discuss matters when I'm finished. Um, I will be speaking for about 30 or 40 minutes, uh, and I think this you'll find this a very well, a very wide-ranging and I think very relevant topic, especially for those of you who plan to spend most of your lives in the 21st century. Um, I know I do. Um, okay, so the title of the talk is Humanity 2.0, and so some of you may wonder what was Humanity 1.0, in case you missed it. Um, and uh, Humanity I, I, I pose this question, by the way, because um, one of the things uh, that strike me, I always ask my students in the beginning of, uh, of a class that I teach on the sociology of knowledge, um, what do they think about when you, you hear the word humanity? And what I tend to get is humane treatment of animals. Okay, so, so in other words, I get that sense of humane. I don't actually get a sense of humanity that relates to human beings. Um, and so I think it is uh, sometimes worth recalling um, what, it, what this concept of humanity was, or is maybe, maybe it still exists, I don't know. It's the kind of concept that was enshrined in the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Um, it's about the, uh, the dignity of the human being, the sanctity of the human body. Um, it refers to a certain privileged character of human existence over other forms of life and the need for moral and political protection of that life form. Um, and of course, uh, this statement of principles was made very explicit in light of what had taken place in World War II uh, and equally what was on the horizon with regard to um, the nuclear age uh, that uh, the world was embarking on in that period. And so, in a sense, we had a very clear sense, at least in terms of politics, about what humanity was, and that there was a sense in which all members of Homo sapiens, the biological species Homo sapiens, was eligible to be part of that, and there was a kind of political presumption that what one was trying to do was to, in some way, provide a decent standard of living um, that actually goes beyond merely uh, treating the body with respect, but actually having to do with life circumstances, raising people from poverty, having health, healthy conditions for living, secure food and water, uh, and also uh, appropriate, uh, appropriate and adequate access to education and to public life. All of these things. Now, this idea of Humanity 1.0 um, wasn't invented in 1948, in a sense, it was rededicated back then, that the original conception, of course, goes back uh, to the Enlightenment, and where the Enlightenment basically secularized a theological notion from the Judeo-Christian tradition of human beings as having been created in the image and likeness of God, and in virtue of that lineage, having certain inalienable rights, as the, uh, the American Declaration of Independence famously put it, right? Um, and that this is something that, in fact, separates us very strongly from animals. Um, what you get with the Enlightenment period is a secularization of that, namely that there's no longer a theological or, or specifically church-based foundation for it, but it becomes one of the responsibilities for this emerging entity, the state, uh, that it is its responsibility to be concerned with the public good, public welfare, the commonwealth. Those kinds of notions start coming into being, and this has to do with enabling individual human beings to flourish, to be able to prosper, to be able to interact freely with each other in a way uh, that is compatible with everyone having the same degree of freedom. And this is basically sort of the foundations of what we call liberalism uh, in the modern era. Uh, and this is very closely tied to what it is to be a fully realized human being. And it was very much part of the Enlightenment legacy. It was very much part of the revolutionary movements of the late 18th century, the American and French revolutions in particular, and inspired the revolutions of the 19th and 20th centuries throughout the world. And the idea was that if you removed the obstacles that were in the way of people, so if you removed the monarchy, if you removed the church, then human beings would, by their nature, be able to flourish in this humanity 1.0 way. Okay, this was kind of the ideal. It's very closely tied with liberalism initially, 
Throughout the 19th and 20th century, it increasingly became a goal of socialism and where socialism um, came to the conclusion that basically that it is impossible to actually have any subset of human beings living this way unless all of them do. Okay, so there is a kind of collective salvation project, you might say, associated with socialism in the old humanity 1.0. Now, one of, the, one of the interesting features, uh, and, and I would say, in a sense, you know, for, especially for European audience, that the most sustained legacy of Humanity 1.0 um, was the welfare state. Um, and the welfare state here, where the state is explicitly dedicated toward these kinds of principles that I was mentioning earlier for human beings. And in a sense, seeing that the state is not doing its job unless it is actually providing for sort of a decent conditions for living for people. Now, this kind of view of things uh, came into crisis starting already in the late 1970s and in the final quarter of the 20th century pretty much fell apart, at least as a sort of default position or a presumption that one could have about dealings with human beings. Um, and. Um, there are many ways to talk about this. I think uh, one can easily talk about the rise of neoliberalism as being sort of one of the contexts in which this change took place. Uh, but, but the effect of it was that uh, there are greater, uh, th th you're seeing increasing inequalities between the rich and the poor, even though there are larger numbers of people, as it were, moving into more wealthy bands. There's very little evidence that there is much political will or determination to actually realize the Humanity 1.0 project for everyone. And the collapse of socialism, I mean, you think about all the projects that were associated with this, they've all either fallen by the wayside or have been very severely questioned or compromised politically. And the economic circumstances do not help matters, okay, in terms of trying to provide arguments for reviving these things. And I often think uh, one of the ways in which you can uh, get a sense of um, where we are with this is why is someone like Jeffrey Sachs, who I think most of you would be familiar with, who's now a World Bank candidate, very famous uh, economist at Columbia University, part of the, who runs the UN Development Aid Program. Um, the man is like a Sunday school preacher, right? He tells you all the problems that need to be solved, makes us feel guilty for a few minutes, but has absolutely no effect on anything. And he's not going to be the next head of the World Bank either. Okay, um, And in a sense, Jeffrey Sachs is kind of one of the latter-day remnants of the Humanity 1.0 ideal. Okay, Making largely the same sorts of arguments that were being made 25, 30 years ago about how you didn't, wouldn't have to redistribute very much to actually enable the whole world to live a decent life, blah, blah, blah. But this doesn't seem to work. Um, and I th would argue that one of the reasons why it doesn't work is not because the economics doesn't make sense. The economics makes perfect sense. Okay? It's what's behind this idea of lack of political will. What is really lying behind that? And, one of the, and, and there, again, there are many kinds of issues. Um, I mean, you, it would be very easy to reduce the discussion to just sort of natural human selfishness. Okay, and, and, and there are certain versions of evolutionary psychology inspired arguments that actually try to provide a biological justification for that. Okay, that the only creatures or beings that we actually should have uh, concern for are those that within our environment help to propagate our genes. And so in a sense we shouldn't just be concerned just because the genes are similar, but rather are they relevant to our survival in the environments in which we operate, right? Which gives you a different kind of answer from a kind of universalism that always lay behind the humanity 1.0 notion. So uh, one can go down that route, but what I want to say here in the talk and what, the, what my book Humanity 2.0 is about is about the kind of new images of the human that are being produced, as it were, on the other side of this. Uh, you know, because uh, we can diagnose why humanity 1.0 has fallen apart and why it's pretty unlikely to get realized in its classical form in the future and why I believe at this point in history the kinds of things that Jeffrey Sachs says, however powerful they are and, and potentially implementable, just are not going to happen. Okay? Um, but what might happen instead? And the way I see things at the moment is that humanity 2.0 is basically a, a kind of a crossroads concept. Okay? So we're on a crossroads as a species. Um, and what we have on either side of the crossroads are two different conceptions of what it is to be a human being. And so I think the first point that needs to be made here 
is that for both of these kinds of visions or utopias or futures that I'm going to be mentioning here, both of them see human beings as dynamic changing creatures. And in that sense, I suppose you might say evolving creatures. Right, so there isn't a sense in either case of there being a human essence, some kind of fixed point, you know, some kind of natural basis on which one could construct norms and so forth. So, there is, so in a sense, human nature is fluid in a way for both of these concepts. And what that means more concretely is that not everything about being a human being now is going to be necessary for being a human being in the future. Okay, and so in a sense you might say one of the presuppositions of let's say a welfare state conception of humanity 1.0 where you basically want, every, you want everyone eventually to live like a northern European, right? That that kind of ideal, which is an ideal based on a certain group of people being amplified indefinitely, which I think a lot of, a lot of the uh, humanity 1.0 thinking was, was on that kind of a trajectory, um, that is not uh, presupposed here. Okay, so there isn't the sense in which there's a kind of static norm that constitutes a decent human life, but rather there are alternatives on the table. And what I want to argue, at least put forward at the outset for you to think about as I'm speaking for the next few minutes, is can we actually live in what we would call a liberal society in which radically different conceptions of what it means to be a human being are both being acted out or being developed in some way? I mean, because one of the things about The classical idea of liberalism, let's say, somebody like John Locke put forward uh, in the 18th century, was um, there was a fundamental belief in the equality of people at an ontological level, you might say, right? In the sense, human beings are these individuals who all roughly live about the same amount of years, they have roughly the same capacities, and where they're greater in some things, they're lesser in others. And so there's a kind of rough equality of people. Right, uh, And uh, that kind of idea is, I think, very important for making plausible the whole idea that we can live in a tolerant liberal society. That no matter how variable people's behaviors are, they're variable within a certain kind of range. And that we're not going to have people kind of going in extreme directions that, let's say, command enormous amount of resources, either emotional resources or economic resources or whatever, that could actually undermine the livelihoods of the other people in the society. Okay, And that was always a presupposition of classical liberal society, that there is a rough equality among people, even as their fortunes changed. Um, And a lot of the, you know, the glorification of the free market in the classical period of people like Adam Smith and so forth presupposes this kind of idea. And that's one reason why they were so much against monopolies and and kind of, uh, you know, a concentration of wealth and and through uh, inheritance and things of that kind. Because it created artificial differences between people that didn't naturally exist. But these, this basic idea of natural equality is blown out of the water t- today um, because people have such different standards under which they're operating with regard to what it is to live an adequate human existence. And it's that variability that in a way challenges the liberal society. Now, the first view I want to talk about, um, and I'm going to just put two, people, two people's names to give you kind of, as it were, polar, polar images of what I'm talking about. The first person is Peter Singer. Okay. Um, and the second is Ray Kurzweil. And uh, let me just. Uh, so where is it? There it is. Uh, okay. Um, how many of you are familiar with Peter Singer, the ethicist? Okay, one, two, three. Ray Kurzweil. Okay, one, two. Okay. Let me explain who these people are then. Um, um, Peter Singer is uh, probably the, the most significant, I mean, people call him um, an animal rights activist or, uh, or philosopher of animal rights. That's not strictly speaking true. He doesn't push the rights side of it, but he is the philosopher of animal liberation. Okay, um, And so the, uh, the basic idea that in, that in a sense animals have been enslaved, kind of in the way in which women and minorities and so forth have been enslaved in the past, right, is an inherent moral wrong and needs to be rectified if we claim to be living in a just society. And where the standard of moral relevance and therefore political relevance is that of the ability to feel pain, the minimization of suffering. Okay, 
So it is a kind of um, a kind of utilitarianism that we're talking about, and that to live in a just or a good society means that we want to maximize. Right? We want to minimize the pain for all of those creatures who can feel pain, and we want to enable those creatures who, to live as flourishing lives as possible in a way that is jointly realizable. So in the idea of there being a sustainable world, a common ecology. So what this means, among other things, and this is, a, this is a, I think, a viewpoint that's quite recognizable, uh, not only from the animal rights movement specifically, but also um, you know, from environmental movement, from the calls about sustainability, um, a lot of the concerns that there is overpopulation of humans on the planet, and that our carbon footprint is much too large, uh, and that we're in a way jeopardizing life forms in general, and that this is an, in, and this is an intrinsic moral wrong, um, all of this kind of line of thinking, uh, which I think I guess nowadays we associate with a certain kind of green politics, um, would basically have human beings, have humanity 2.0, reabsorb itself back into nature. That is to say, um, to, to rekindle, to reconnect with what it is, you know, as it were, with our evolutionary past, with a lot of our fundamental biological information, namely that our genetic overlap with other animals is like at the 95 to 97 percent level, um, to basically, a, it's a kind of a back to nature approach, where the sorts of aspects of the human condition that have magnified our difference from nature, those should be minimized. Okay, that, so it's sort of back to nature in that sense, and that's how we're going to have a sustainable world, one where all the creatures, all the living creatures can live together. And Humanity 2.0 is that revised sense of the human that in a sense renounces the claim of privilege, which is largely this kind of theological notion which carried through to the Enlightenment and into the Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, that we renounce that, basically, and that we have this kind of more general kind of commitment to life. And under those circumstances, then, one might talk about there being too many human beings around. We shouldn't be bringing some of them into existence. We should allow some of them to go earlier. That there isn't anywhere, in that sense, an intrinsic sanctity to human life. Right? It is all relative to the larger kind of ecology of pleasure and pain in which human beings op occupy a certain space. So that's Ray, that's Peter Singer. Now, Ray Kurzweil um, is, um, uh, well, he's, uh, he, he originally uh, earned his reputation as, an, as a, basically an entrepreneur, an innovator in speech recognition technology. Okay? Um, but what he's primarily known for these days and what his relevance is to this discussion um, is um, this idea of the singularity, which you uh, may have run across in some of the science fiction and some of the more futuristic writing. Uh, and, and the basic idea here uh, is that just because we have come into existence after billions of years of evolutionary history, and we are, as it were, these carbon-based creatures very much like those ancestors from which we evolved, it doesn't follow that to better realize our distinctly human qualities that we need to be staying in that carbon-based existence. That in some sense we ought to be either um, sort of attaching ourselves to other kinds of other non-biological forms, perhaps cyborgs. You may be familiar with this from, from, sci from science fiction, whereby you have a kind of an amalgamation of human and machine parts, implantation of silicon chips, or the most extreme case would be um, where we upload our consciousness and our computational and other intellectual powers into a computer that can go on forever and do the sorts of mental things that distinguish human beings from other creatures. This is a completely different worldview. Um, and it's a worldview that in a sense sees nature very much as the enemy. Um, you know, it's the thing that's holding us back. The, the, fact that we, the fact that we have to, you know, die, for example, becomes a big problem. Um, and so there's, look, there's a search for alternative ways of realizing ourselves in some kind of alternative medium. Now, this kind of viewpoint, I think, on the surface, uh, might seem very far-fetched, and a lot of people don't take it very seriously. Um, but nevertheless, I do think, and this is, I think, in a way, a key point about this kind of development, is that people are already thinking along these lines, in the sense that they're already mentally preparing themselves for these kinds of futures, regardless of whether they come about. Uh, and I do think one, one very important benchmark with regard to the... Uh, 
The second option, the one associated with Kurzweil, um, is the degree of intimacy with which uh, we have developed relationships with cyberspace. Okay, the extent to which increasing amounts of our social life and intellectual life and all other kinds of life are mediated through computer interfaces, um, the various kinds of communication, information technologies these make possible, the kinds of identities these enable us to adopt, and the extent to which we consider those identities in many cases more meaningful and important than the ones that we normally occupy when we're on biological time. Okay, and so, you know, you take extreme cases of things like Second Life, where you have avatars and things of that sort. Um, this is something that absorbs a lot of people's time, um, and where people find a lot of meaning in life, and where what they take their, their biological existence to be just one of drudgery. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, there even, there's a sense in which the law is beginning to catch up with this, um, and so now there are some active discussions in legal forums about um, supposing you create an avatar uh, and, and you give the avatar, you program the avatar in a way that it can interact without your actual intervention, but this avatar then causes some sort of trouble in Second Life or somewhere else in cyberspace, are you then held accountable? You, the person who created them? Or does the avatar, in some sense, can bear responsibility? In which case, what do you do to it to make it realize its responsibility? Okay, um, more kind of uh, realistically, you might say, at least in the ways we still think about things. There was a case recently in Britain in which a, a, a man and a woman who uh, were, met each other through their avatars in Second Life got married in real life, and then the wife discovered in Second Life that the husband's avatar was having an affair with an avatar in Second Life, and she files for divorce, and she's granted the divorce. Okay? Um, and, uh, you know, so in other words, the law as we normally understand it is being extended into the cyber realities. And part of the justification for it is, is that this is part of the, the, the meaningful world in which these people inhabit. So in other words, this guy was spending his quality time in Second Life. This is, in fact, how he met his wife in the first place. And so the fact that he's having an affair in that capacity, right, actually means a lot under the circumstances. And that needs to be taken seriously. Now you see, the technology that's involved in these kinds of episodes I've been describing are not the really kind of sci-fi, out-of-this-world stuff that people like Ray Kurzweil and the Singularity crowd are aspiring to, but nevertheless, uh, they are mentally preparing people to move in that direction, where in a sense, one sense of identity, one sense of meaning is invested in that other place outside of the biological body, and that is where all the action is happening. Um, and I can tell you right now, uh, it is one of the hottest areas in the law to try to figure this out. Because it is imagined that there will be more and more cases of this kind arising in the future. Okay, so there is this whole... So, so we're moving in these two radically different directions, it seems to me. Um, and, um, I mean, one way in which you can see the difference between these two directions um, is in terms of their attitudes towards science. Okay, now, my own work is primarily in the philosophy and sociology of science, and it's really striking. You have really two quite different images of science with these two viewpoints. So, with the Peter Singer back-to-nature viewpoint, um, very often this viewpoint is associated with what's known in, the, in environmental circles as the precautionary principle. Okay, the precautionary principle. This has been invoked a lot, especially in the recent, uh, recent uh, discussions trying to get global legislation on climate change. Okay, precautionary principle gets raised, and the idea here is basically do not make any serious technological interventions unless you've got all the science worked out to know what the consequences are going to be so that you know you're not going to be doing any harm. And if you think you might be doing harm because there's some uncertainty that you cannot anticipate, then don't do anything. Okay, that's a precautionary principle. Now, science figures in a very interesting way in this principle because science basically is, is used as a way of gathering data for purposes of slowing down technological progress, right? That we want to check everything out. We want the evidence in first. We want to know whether things will work. We are not just going to do some kind of genetic modification just because it'll sell some food, because we want to know what the downstream effects might be of the genetic modification, you see? So the science is used as a sort of a constraint on the technology, and there's some sense in which science is presumed to be able to provide some kind of certainty, some resolution of the uncertainty that makes policy interventions with technology so dangerous for the world. 
Now, the other side of the argument proposes what a, more, a term that is less familiar, but is basically the antithetical principle. It's called the proactionary principle. Now, this is this, this phrase, the proactionary principle. If you look it up on Google, you'll see it only gets about 30,000 hits, whereas the precautionary principle gets about a million point four. Okay, the proactionary principle was first formalized only in 2004, um, and it is very much part of the, uh, the sort of the transhumanist jargon, you know. And so the transhumanists are the people who are sympathetic to the uh, vision of Ray Kurzweil, and the proactionary principle has a different image of science. That science basically is the engine of technology, and that there's a sense in which that you know you you can't know things about the world especially aspects of the world where you expect that what you've known in the past may be wrong or may be changed unless you intervene that intervention is necessary to learn even when you make mistakes this is very much a kind of a, if you're familiar in the philosophy of science with pragmatism or Karl Popper or people like that where science is about hypothesis testing only in this case you're talking about not just a hypothesis in the, in the intellectual sense of testing it in an experiment, but rather using a new technological innovation as a kind of, kind of mat fully materialized hypothesis to see what the effects are. And there's just really no way you can know what the truth of a situation is until you intervene. And then it becomes important, of course, to learn from the mistakes, to catch the errors soon enough, and to revise one's understanding of things. But you need to take risks. If you are unwilling to take risks, then you cannot make progress. Okay? Um, and in fact, the proactionary principle goes further and says that, the, again, on this line of what distinguishes human beings from other animals is the fact that we are able to take, we have been able to take successfully calculated risks down through the ages. Where we adopt certain kinds of practices, we transform our world in various ways, well before we know what all the full consequences are, and indeed, at the cost of absorbing some very negative consequences, at least in the short term. But nevertheless, in the long term, we're made stronger for it. And the fact that we don't do this completely recklessly, we actually do it in a fairly selective way, but nevertheless we succeed, is a mark of our collective intelligence as a species. But that collective intelligence can only be, continue to be promoted if we continue to take risks. And, and, uh, and even though they are scary and all the rest of it. And so the proactionary principle is basically on that line. That basically says that if you want to learn how the world works, if you want to see what the limits of our understanding are, you have to intervene. You have to do something. Okay. Um, so these are two quite radically different principles, not only with regard to the attitudes toward risk, but to the notions of science that are presupposed in their attitudes toward risk. Um, and um, in work that I'm doing now... Um, with a co-author, uh, Veronica Lipinska, and I'll put her name up here, um, we are basically mapping the new political and intellectual space that's opened up by this difference in principle. Because we believe that in the 21st century, this is going to turn into the new right-left. Okay, where the right is the precautionary principle and the left is the proactionary principle. It's not the old right-left, for sure. It's not the old right-left. It, re it scrambles the political field in a way, um, but nevertheless, it kind of highlights kind of the, the kind of crossroads we're in with regard to the future of humanity, because the issue is going to be, how do you evaluate where we have gone in the modern era? There's a sense in which that's the question on the table for Humanity 2.0. Do you think that in a sense we have gone too far in the modern era, that we've transformed the natural environment too much, right? that we have introduced too much technology, that we've moved too far away from nature, right? we've overpopulated the planet, and so as a result, we have to pull back. We have to recalibrate. That's the precautionary view. On the other hand, if you believe that the modern era was fine, it just didn't go far enough, and that it needs to continue, right, and maybe even accelerate, then you're on the proactionary side. Okay? And so there's a sense in which the Humanity 2.0 debate is about a verdict on the last 200 years, let's say, from the time of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, about what has happened to the human condition in that period. Right? Does one consider it an overall good or an overall bad? Okay? Um, and uh, I'm going to stop here. I don't know exactly how long I've been speaking, about 
I'm going to stop here because I think I've sort of laid the issue on the table clearly enough uh, and maybe we can discuss this more in terms of your interests. But, but thank you very much.